groups. There's a couple other words that we can use. One is specialization. In other words, when you have a class that's inherited from another class, what you're saying is the second class or the subclass is a more specialized version of the first class. So vehicle and automobile. Well, a vehicle is a more general description. A car, an automobile, is a more specialized description. So in that case, the car would be the subclass, the vehicle would be the superclass. So the, the specialized version inherits from the general version. Um, the one thing that we said is that um, there, there's something called the is a test. If you can easily say that this is a that, or this is an example of that, then this is probably the subclass, that is probably the superclass. So a car is a vehicle. Car is a subclass, the vehicle is the superclass. So it's a more specialized version of it. And the idea is this, is that when you look at different things like this, whether you have a superclass and a subclass, there are certain behaviors in the superclass that the subclass shares, has all the same attributes, has all the same behaviors, plus it might have some different behaviors. It might have some brand new behaviors that the subclass, I'm sorry, that the superclass doesn't have. It may also have some behaviors that are different than what the superclass has. And the example we gave last time was between graduate student and student. All right? Graduate students do many of the same things that regular students do. They enroll in classes, they drop classes, they get a grade in classes, they apply for degrees, and so on. But there might be some things that graduate students do the same as regular students, but the way that they do it is different. For example, how a graduate student gets charged tuition is different than how a regular student gets charged tuition. And there might be some things that graduate students do or have attributes for that regular students don't. A graduate student, for example, will have uh, an undergrad degree, or a, or a typical student probably won't. All right. So because of all these things, rather than rewriting and reinventing the wheel each time and having each class sort of independent, we make use of inheritance. And with inheritance, you remove the, uh, you eliminate the need to duplicate some code. So in the example that we went over last time, we had three classes. We had our base class, or the super class, which was a sales rep class. If we're going to draw a class diagram for this, I'm not going to draw the entire class, class diagram, but I'll start out. If we were to draw a class diagram for this, it would look like this. All right. That is saying that sales rep is the base class or the super class. Inherited from that are two other classes, a junior sales rep and a senior sales rep. When we say that they're inherited, what it means is it gets everything that exists on the super class for free. So the attributes of the sales rep include the employee ID, which is an integer. A name, which is a string. A sales amount, which is a double. We also have a bunch of attributes here. We have set ID. I'm sorry, not attributes, but methods. Get ID. Sets and gets for all the fields, along with a Get commission, get base salary, 
get total salary. All right. Now, in our example, there are, new, no, there are no new attributes for junior sales rep and, se and senior sales rep. And some of the methods can simply be used directly from the superclass. But there's a couple of them that are overridden because we have different ways of computing the base salary and the commission for junior and senior sales reps. So the way we would show this in a class diagram is that junior and sales reps don't have any new attributes, but they do have their own get commission function and get base salary. The idea, again, is that we're coding the differences. A junior and senior sales rep have an ID just like a regular sales rep does. So we don't need to redefine the ID for the junior and senior sales rep. We don't need to redefine the get and set methods for the ID for the junior and senior sales rep. It's the exact same thing. Likewise with name, likewise with monthly sales. However, commission and base salary are computed different ways for a senior, junior sales rep, and regular sales rep. Therefore, we override this. So what we ended up in code looks like this. Here we have the sales rep class with the attributes, all the get and set methods, a get commission, which we defined for a regular sales rep is 10%, the base salary, which is 2,000 per month, and the total salary is the base salary plus commission. What do we have for the other two sales reps, for the junior and senior sales rep? For the junior sales rep, the only thing that's different is how we calculate the base salary and how we calculate commission. Junior sales reps only get paid 7.5% commission and their base salary is $1,500. We've said that it extends sales rep, so we get those other methods and attributes without having to do anything. And same thing for senior sales rep. We extend sales rep, and we have a get base salary, and we have get commission. Notice we don't have to change get total salary. That's kind of a trick question, right? Because the total salary is still defined as a base salary plus commission. For a senior sales rep, you'll use this equation to calculate the commission and this to calculate the base salary. But you still add them together to get the total salary. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to write a little test code here to make sure that this works. Because I think that's where we left off last time. And as we make our test code, we're going to play around with it a little bit and see the results that we get. Um, one thing that we will probably get to today is the idea of constructors. Notice I have not created any constructors on these. We'll talk about that after we run through a couple simple tests. So I'm going to go File, New, and I'm going to make a public class unit test could probably at a certain point of the semester do this in my sleep I'm going to create one of each kind of sales rep, assign their ID, name, and then output something about them. So I'm going to say <coughs> sales rep S1, S regular, equals new sales rep. As regular 
that set ID equals or set ID to one 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 $10,000 of sales. Now I'm going to output some stuff. Name is as regular dot get name. Sales S dot regular get sales amount base salary. commission, and total salary. Let's start off doing this. And let's start off doing this. Let's make sure that we got it down right just for a regular sales rep before we move on and try the other ones. So I'm going to save this as unit test.java. All right. Go into the PowerShell. Java C. I'm just going to do star Java, so I'm going to get everything compiled. The Java compiler is smart enough to compile what it needs to compile. So I'm actually not going to do Java C star dot Java. I'm going to do Java C unit test. And it returns amp ID is an error. Because it should public yep. Thank you. 
would have stared at that for a few more minutes. Okay. Notice what it compiled, it compiled unit test and sales wrap. So even though I said only to compile unit test, it did sales wrap as well. Why? Because it's smart enough to say that unit test needs sales wrap. So it compiled sales rep and unit test. So now if I execute unit test, tells me Eleanor had $10,000 of sales, their base salary is $2,000, their commission is $1,000, and their total salary is $3,000. I typoed on the last field. That should say total salary. Okay. I'm going to make this Eleanor regular to indicate that they're a, a regular sales rep. I'm then going to output a blank line, which is something you can do just to make your, the, your test a little easier to read. It's not essential, obviously, but I wouldn't waste too much time formatting the output of this. But, you know, if it's a little easier to read, it, it will help you a little bit. So this worked, in other words, because according to our rule, the base salary for a regular sales rep should be $2,000, which it said. Their sales is $10,000, and their sales uh, commission would be 10% of that. That's $1,000. 10,000, oh, I'm sorry, 1,000 plus 2,000 equals 3,000. So this worked and gave me the results I wanted. Now let's go and do this for a junior sales rep and a senior sales rep. So I'm going to copy this. equals new junior sales rep. Change the name to Eleanor Junior. All right, I'm going to run the same test on the junior sales rep. I'll compile Java C dot Java. Clear screen. We now have compiles for three of our classes. And Eleanor Regular gets paid at the regular sales rate. $10,000, base salary is $2,000, commission is 10% of that, or $1,000, total salary is that. Eleanor Junior, sales is also $10,000, their base salary is $1,500, their commission is $750, their total salary is $2,250. So that works. All right. Notice that. When I call, I can call get name, get sales rep, set ID, set name, set sales rep, get total uh, salary, even though that's not defined on a junior sales rep. Why? Because it's defined in the sales rep class. And those things, the instance variables are made protected, and the Methods are public, so anyone can call them. So this guy can call them. So you know there's no set ID, set name, set sales amount, get name, get sales amount, and so on. I can still call those methods because they were defined on the super class. All right? 
And when I call the methods that they have in common, get base salary and get commission, I get the version of them that's defined for a junior sales rep. So I get the proper version of that function like I'd expect. All right, we're going to finish this up, finish up this part of the example by creating a third sales rep who is a senior sales rep. <laughs> You're right, I don't. <laughs> Wasn't paying attention. Alright. So, I think I've done everything right. I've made the senior sales rep. Repeat that, please. Yeah, that's just the dummy line at the bottom. So I'll save this. Recompile everything. Run it. All right, Eleanor Sr. gets, also has $10,000 sale. Um, base salary of $2,500, which is a correct for a senior sales rep. Their commission is... 1250 uh, and their total is uh, 3750 If you look, the formula was applied correctly because if they get over 10,000 sales, um, they get um, 12 and a half plus the amount over 10,000. Well, there's none over 10,000, so it's just 12 and a half percent. Now to thoroughly test this, I'd probably want to do what? I'd probably want to do a sales rep that makes more than, that has made more than $10,000 sales. So I might put senior two. This is known as sometimes white box testing. is called that because I am writing my test cases based on me knowing what the code is. I know that there's an if statement in there for more than 15,000 for senior sales reps. So I'm going to make sure I have a test case for that. Black box testing is where you would not look inside the code and you would have to really test more thoroughly because you don't really understand what's going on under the hood. But here, because I understand the programming, I know, gee, I better go and test another sales rep just to make sure that the calculation is correct. So I'll go and do that. That's right. The total's right. Is a commission right? Hmm. They get paid twelve and a half, and an extra, and an extra two point five percent for the amount over ten thousand. So they had twenty thousand, right? So twelve and a half of twenty thousand is what? Um, two thousand five hundred, right? And then 2.5% for the amount over that, so that is another, um, I hope I'm seeing the decimal points right in my head, that's another $250. So the total should be like 2750 which is correct. All right, yay. So we've developed test cases here to make sure that this works. 
and we define the test cases. Since there's no conditionals in junior and, and regular sales rep, we can really get by with testing them a little bit less. We have to test the senior a little bit more because we know there's an if statement in there. And therefore, there's two kinds of sales rep, senior sales reps, one that makes more than a cutoff, one that makes less than a cutoff. OK. If we were defining test cases, we would define those. And we would put down what we expected to happen, what the, res uh, what the result was, and whether it passed or not. So I might say one test case is do a regular sales rep that sells $10,000 worth of sales. And I would expect the base salary to be $2,000, the commission to be $1,000, and the total salary to be $3,000. So we could check that off. If we look in Canvas, we'll see where I have that. I have an example that looks at the test cases and shows how to document a test case. They have some of these things like an ID, a description, steps, blah, 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 blah. Scenario is like what you're going to do. So I might say test a regular sales rep that has sold $10,000 worth of merchandise. Test step, you know, create that object. Expected result, this is what I think the commission, regular salary, and total salary should be. Actual outcome, yep, it worked. All right. Now, let's back up a second and let's talk about constructors. All right, because there's a couple of I don't know how I say, a couple of extra things before we're done with the topic of inheritance. Now, inheritance is one of those things that is a relatively easy concept, but I think it takes a little while for it to sink in, and it takes a while for you to see where you can use it and how you can benefit up from it. In this case, we could see how we benefit from it, right? Because we don't have to go and repeat all these functions for the other kinds of sales reps. Right? We define them in one place and we just say, well, a junior sales rep is a certain kind of sales rep. So it extends sales reps. So it has everything that a regular sales rep has, but it does some things differently. And it might have some additional things. We haven't done any additional functions here yet. We will either towards the end of class today or next time. Now constructors couple things to keep in mind. First of all, remember the old rule. If you do not define any constructors, the default no argument constructor is generated from you, for you rather, and all it does is allocate the memory for the class, and that's it. So that rule still applies. I didn't define any constructors in anything in this example. Yet I didn't run into any difficulty because the compiler generated no argument constructor was provided by the compiler. So that's rule one to remember. Rule two to remember is that for a subclass's constructor to run, the superclass's constructor has to run first. All right, which if you think about it logically sort of makes sense. All right, you're first a sales rep, then you're a junior sales rep. If, we're, if we define a car as a, a subclass of vehicle, you have to create a vehicle first and then you can create the specialized part of it to say it's a car. So the superclass's constructor happens, has to work run first. Now in this case, I know constructors anywhere. What happens when I call the constructor on the junior sales rep class? It, there is no constructor for it, so it uses the default. That default constructor will call the constructor on the super class. And it will call the default constructor on it because we didn't specify which constructor to use. All right? That's okay, because we didn't define any constructors on the superclass either. 
So the default constructor exists for it too. So really, even though I say new, junior sales rep here, first the constru default constructor for a sales rep runs, then the default constructor for the junior sales rep runs. Yes? So what happens if you define a constructor as a super class and not the subclass? OK, really good question. All right, that brings up the third rule that I think I mentioned last time, but I forgot to mention today. Constructors don't inherit. So let's go and let's put a constructor. Let's do exactly what you said. And this will take maybe a few examples for it to catch on, because I recognize it's a little confusing. But I'm going to create a constructor. public sales rep that's going to expect the three attributes. I don't know of any. I mean, I can't guarantee there's not a limit, but I'm not sure there I'm not sure there's a realistic one. I want you to think in your head what you think is going to happen when I compile this. You're going to get an error on my OK. Assuming everything is spelled right. <laughs> now, I want you to think in your head what's going to happen. OK. I'm adding a three argument constructor to the sales wrap. And I haven't touched the other two classes. All right. I get errors. All right. I get three errors. Actually, maybe four errors. I don't know. I should have gotten error on this. I get an error on this. I get an error on this. I should get an error on this. I should get an error on every constructor. Let's let me put in the values for the sales rep constructor. I get two errors. OK. I get two errors on the sales rep, junior sales rep, uh, one error on the junior sales rep, one error on the senior sales rep. Let's see what the error says. Constructor sales rep and class sales rep cannot be applied to given types. Required int string double found no arguments. That's kind of a very confusing way to word it. I'll, I'm going to try to simplify it. I call the no argument function the no argument constructor on junior sales rep. I can do that, right? I can do that because the no argument constructor is generated for junior sales rep. Right, because I haven't defined any constructors in junior sales wrap. All right, that's true. Well, what's the problem then? Well, the problem comes in from the second rule that I mentioned. 
I have to first create the sales rep object. I have to first run the constructor on the sales rep object. Then I can run the constructor on the junior sales rep. I have not defined a constructor. I have not defined the zero argument constructor for the junior sales rep. That part's OK. But it is going to try to call the zero argument constructor on the sales rep class, which doesn't exist anymore because I made this one. So if I call a no argument constructor, if I don't define any constructors, it doesn't exist. That's fine for that object. However, the super class is also going to try to call the no argument constructor on that class, which no longer exists. All right. And the third rule comes in because we don't inherit constructors. All right. So I'm going to try this. I'm going to go into each of these, junior and senior sales rep, and I'm going to put in a constructor that looks exactly like the constructor for a senior, um, I mean for a regular sales rep. And I'm going to do that for the junior sales rep, and I'm going to do that for the two senior sales reps. I want you to think in your head what's going to happen. Make sure I've saved them all. I have. I compile them. I get an error again. And it's the same looking kind of error. It says found no arguments. What it's trying to do is I did not explicitly say which constructor on the sales rep class I wanted to call. Therefore, it is assumed I wanted the no argument constructor. Well, I don't have any code in here that says call the super class's three argument constructor. So it calls the, the sales rep, the super class's zero argument constructor. And there isn't one there. There's an additional step somewhere. What we have to do is we have to call, explicitly say, hey, if I create one of these guys, I want the super class's three argument constructor to run as well. In fact, I can actually get rid of this code, and I can say super arg amp ID. Arg name, arg sales amount. Super says call this function 
on the super class. Specifically, super by itself says call the constructor of the super class that has these arguments, that has the three arguments in this case. Now, the compiler knows explicitly, I said, don't just call any constructor on the super. Don't just call the no argument constructor. Call the constructor that accepts three arguments. So it's going to call this one, set those variables, and then if there was anything else we wanted to do, we could put it after that. Now, the super statement has to be the first statement in any of the subclasses constructors if you're going to use it. So I couldn't do some stuff here and then say, oh yeah, by the way, go and call that constructor. Which makes sense if you followed the discussion I had before where I said that the superclass has to be created before you can create the subclass. So the, 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 the superclass's constructor has to run before you run any constructors on the subclass. This is part of what's known as constructor chaining. There's a little more to this, but this is enough for right now. So I fixed the senior sales rep constructor, and I'm going to fix the junior sales rep constructor to do the same thing. And now, everything should be back to normal. No compile errors, and we can run this. Oops. And it works. So the rules about constructors, to summarize them. The superclasses constructor has to run before you can run the subclasses constructor. The no argument constructor works the same with inherited stuff as it does with regular objects. That is, if you don't supply any constructors, then a no argument, very basic constructor will be generated for you. If you don't explicitly say by using the super command which constructor you want to execute on the super class, then the compiler assumes that you want the no argument constructor. All right. So very often, you'll see something like this. There's a constructor that exists on the superclass. There'll be one like it on the subclass with the same signature that simply calls the same constructor on the superclass. And that's it. Now, if there's other initialization you wanted to do, you could do that here as well. So if you would have had a, if you set up a manual no constructor or no argument constructor on the superclass, would you just try to call that? Yes. Okay. Yes. So if I didn't have this in here, let's just eliminate this from, from, we'll comment it out temporarily just to show this. And I create a no argument no argument constructor And I set the name to something like that. No argument constructor on sales rep called. If I call this constructor on the junior sales rep, I have not explicitly said what constructor I want on the sales rep. It will therefore call the no argument constructor, and we'll see that. So I'll do that, then I'll remove that code, because I can see where that would be confusing if you stumble across this code. Oh. Oh, I didn't save everything. 
my mistake. No error you didn't construct a on sales rep class called. Because what happened is I called the three argument constructor on the sales rep. I didn't explicitly say what constructor I want on the sales rep class, so it called the no argument constructor on the sales rep. You would think that maybe it would match up and call the constructor on the superclass that had the same number of arguments. No, it's not, it doesn't work that way. I mean, we could lo argue whether that was logical or not, but it just doesn't work that way, so we might as well forget it. So you'll see a lot of this, where if you have a constructor on the superclass, you have a constructor on the subclass that just passes the arguments back up to it. And then again, it could do some other initialization here after it, but this has to be the first thing. Questions? All right. Uh, next time we will start talking about, we might do more with constructor chaining. We will uh, talk about polymorphism and what that means. And we'll talk about abstract classes and methods and what those mean. And we'll talk about interfaces. All right. <laughs> Uh, that's probably a little more than two classes worth of material, so next week is probably better than to say next class. All right, we'll see you next week.